Do you want to talk some footy there, Kane? I do. I got I got a lot of footy that uh, I, I want to talk about. But just, just quickly, the update on Sam Mitchell is there. Oh. Is, I, I saw that he was he was back. The Channel Seven cameras in Melbourne had him at the airport, and speaking about the experience, he said he's not quite ready to share everything that that mm. happened. But it was a couple of rough days there for for him and clearly his family and his wife looking after three kids in a, in a foreign city, and he's going to ease his way back into work. But he feels pretty comfortable with yeah. where the players are at and how the program is tracking. But, uh, yeah, a nasty one, but good to see he's back. Is there anything further you can add? So he'll be back at the club today, not on the track. It will only be, in fact, he'll only be in um, very rarely this week, just a few hours indoors today, I'm told. So very much easing back into it. But back in the country, as you say, after the trip from hell, and we can tell you, Kane, that this trip got worse. Worse. Before he returned home to yeah. Melbourne as well. Out of the, Aside from spending seven nights either side of Christmas Day in hospital in New York with uh, pneumonia, was disastrous with his wife and his three kids. Um, but after leaving New York... The family, the Mitchell family, were in Los Angeles. And we can tell you that, unbelievably, the Mitchell family had some luggage stolen. What police say was uh, might have been a suspected, carefully planned robbery, almost a, a targeted uh, burglary. Some electronic stuff was taken, the typical stuff. But also, Sam's passport was taken as well. And maybe a couple of other passports in the family were taken as well. So this is on the day, I believe, they were due to fly back to Melbourne as well. So all sorts of carnage around missing passports how are they going to get back now the police incredibly were able to get it back on the same day so when the next piece of bad luck happened a delayed flight but in the end the delayed flight helped them because i'm told it was a pretty wild wow. sort of trip to the airport to make the flight it was delayed by the time they got all their passports and all their belongings uh back from the, from the robbery so understandably some very stressful moments so by the time he did land in melbourne he would have been like oh. we never well, what a, write a book on poor this bugger from this trip Poor so bugger. the luggage was stolen from the airport? No, I believe they weren't at the airport. They were out of the airport. I think they'd even, uh, might have even got a car like and a they might day have trip spent a day yeah, okay. in Los Angeles, you know, uh, before coming home. And it was in that small period of time that he's managed to get his passport stolen, among other valuables as well. So just incredible. The poor bugger and the awesome. family have been through hell. He'll be at the club today and he would have got that update over there just while we're speaking about injuries shortly on Will Day, of course, and that uh, nasty foot injury as well. So all in all, just a catastrophic holiday for, yep. for Sam Mitchell, unfortunately. Hey, we're going to see some headlines surrounding pre-season training in the next, well, every day, really. We're going to see, we're going to see headlines. I noticed that the Herald Sun got sucked in over the weekend. Two. <laughs> this is the headline. Jake Stringer burned up the track in a promising uh. preseason outing. Now, what did we discuss last week about Cam Zerha and the fact that nothing motivates a player more than being out of contract? Don't get sucked in into any Jake Stringer hype. Uh, this preseason, remember what happened last time he was out of contract, 2021, Yeah, uh, yep. where he told us that he lost a staggering seven kilograms he revealed that himself afl uh and he had a great year uh, averaged nearly 17 touches and kicked 41 goals for the year got himself a three-year contract extension mm. and then we haven't seen him for three years and now all of a sudden he's out of contract he's burning up the track i did love the fact that uh brad scott had him in the in the b team from as, as what I, I could have read but the last thing essendon needs to do is get sucked into this hype and one year contracts forever for Jake, can we just yeah. can we just say uh, that as a motivating factor? Yeah, I'd I'd agree with that. And and but clearly though, just to to play the other side of it, there is a story this time every year, multiple ones. Every, every on Jake year. Stringer, every on Jake year. Stringer himself though, he's a magnet for he his body is discussed perhaps while we're on this topic more than any other player's physique. Mm. Is he too heavy? Is he too light? Look what the weight he's lost. Look at this. Look at that. Mm. Is he out of shape? For some reason, we zero in on this man. More than any other well, because player, because I out think there. the upside is so great. Massive, like how yep. important he is. Champion data in that twenty twenty one year had him as the number one ranked player in the league. Like with what he did and how important he was, we've seen him win games of his own boot, and then we've seen mm. him not touch it in in a whole month of football. So that that's the real frustration. So my my point would be, and I'm not, I'm not picking on him. I just don't understand why you need that as a motivating factor like why where is the self drive why does he why does it need that and the contract status to be such a motivating factor clearly for him we've seen it time and time again so i mean he's a perfect example of someone that you'd have hungry and, and staying yeah. on these one year deals and nothing and you wouldn't even consider speaking about his contract until sort of august i wouldn't if i was the bombers but i'd just be i'd be frustrated if i was a bombers fan of 
um, you know, White gets to this point each and every time he, he's out of contract. And I was listening to a, uh, a podcast yesterday, the Bill Simmons podcast, and they were speaking about the NBA and the fact that the NBA had scheduled the old school great teams in the marquee slots. Um, so the Golden State Warriors with with Steph Curry and, and clearly the Lakers with LeBron, high drawing audience, they put them in the marquee spots, but their performance hasn't delivered on on that and they're actually not great to watch anymore. Golden mm. State are really struggling and uh, as are the Lakers. And they're talking about how it's moved on, like how the, we want to watch, they're talking about OKC, the young OKC, which Josh Giddy's involved in the Australian they're young, they play fast, they're the, the, one of the, the best teams in the competition. I wonder whether it's got to that point, and I wanted to ask you the question of, who are you excited to watch this year? Like, f- for me, it's not, I mean, Richmond will always get the marquee slots, but it's not Richmond anymore. Like, I don't want to watch mm. Kaczynski and, and Samson Ryan in the forward line and, and McIntosh on the wing and a banged mm. up Dion Prestia and, and Jacob Hobbs. I don't want to watch that. I want to watch the Giants. Like, I'm really excited to watch. I, I love watching Adelaide play. I think the way that they play. So when you look at the schedule and the fixture, have we rewarded those younger teams and, and who has the biggest upside and who, who we want to watch enough this year? Yeah, because there's an element of crystal balling with this with the AFL. 100%. You know, they they, they take easy. what they see from 2023 and they try to predict the future. And I think we're pretty good at that as who an industry. Who do you like fact, watching? Uh, all those sides you mentioned, I think Hawthorne had some real yeah. moments this year. That slingshot game will always appeal. I, I just love – it's not new, of course. I just love watching Collingwood play and the yeah. way they play. Yeah. It's an un, un uh, just a faith in the system. Do you like watching that, your team play? Yeah, well, I think we park our own team because, well, unless – is anyone out there who wouldn't like watching their own team? No, I I, I'm, I'm more – um, specifically talking about the Blues. Like, so, yeah, I'll, the question is, who yes. other than your I, team I think, are you most keen to watch this year? I'm really keen to watch the Blues. Like, I really I think Carlton are exciting, enjoy yeah. watching watching the Blues. But have have we moved on, and is it as, as exciting to watch Geelong play anymore? For, for, for me, it's not. Their midfield is is old and, and slow. And if Jeremy Cameron doesn't get you, like, who are you excited to mm-hmm. watch for the Cats? And a bit of Melbourne as well. Like Melbourne frustrate me a little bit to watch. Oh, yeah. so have we got to a point where we're going to move on from speaking a lot about those big marquee successful teams of yesteryear and go into a new era where we're watching the Giants? We love that. And Adelaide and I don't know where I stand on, on the Western Bulldogs because I, oh, the, I love yeah, the talent a, on their list. Yeah. But, I used to love watching them play yeah. too, that the happy handball club and everything from the 2016, 2017, and, and even their grand final loss to Melbourne. Now it just feels like it needs a real refresher, doesn't it? They need something else to – and I'm speaking purely from a popcorn point mm-hmm. of view here. Am I willing to sit down and, and be absorbed by it? I think Sydney as well play an exciting brand as well when they that. get the pill and go through the middle of the SCG, they can be exciting to watch as well. Um, and, and Brisbane always prioritise goals also. So no, I love I mean, watching I, I, Brisbane. All right, one three hundred seven three six seven three six. 736 736 Other than your team, who do you want to watch? Uh, and is it time that the AFL sort of culture of putting the big Victorian teams that have had success in those marquee slots moves on uh, a little bit? Jacob Wiedering. Yeah. Is, is this the one, like, I don't know if I said it out loud, but every year there's one at Carlton, funnily enough. There is always every one. Every year. Every year without fail. I'm not sure if I said it on air or I thought it or we said it privately or I was speaking to someone else, but I said, hold, don't hold your breath. There will be one. You said and it like, well, you were so frustrated last year. There Sam will be Walsh one. had the, the rod in his back oh. and he's had ankle stuff. And- Zach Williams. I mean, it, there is one every time, I'm telling you. And this time it's Jacob Wiedering's turn, so it's a calf tear and a real nasty one. They're saying two months. So that puts round one in serious jeopardy. As we said, it's this time of year where you just cross everything mm. as a supporter of your own team. They just get through. And I reckon Jacob Wiedering absolutely fits into that basket of play you'd least afford to lo- want to lose. He's probably he's probably he'd one. have to be. I think he's at, at Carlton, he's probably one now. He's not their best. He's I reckon not their he's one of two. Player. I reckon he's one of two. I reckon it's him and Charlie yeah, Kerno. Yeah. I still think you can you can almost more cover for Kerno than you can... For Weedering, reigning best and fairest winner is so important to the way they set up, and there's not a lot of depth at the Blues for that for that position. So the, back, no. The one at your club you can ill afford to lose. We oh. we mentioned Callum Mills at at Sydney, and when we did our hold me to it segment 
Last oh, year, boy. I said that uh, Sydney can't win the premiership without Mills. Can Carlton win the premiership without Wiedering? I know it's only a calf injury and he'll be back. No, I don't, I don't think so. No. I don't no. know if they can I, either. I, if this happened in August, you'd be really worried. I don't, I don't think so. It's almost no. the Nathan, must be the Nathan Lyon real pop of the calf where you can hardly... He's given it a good calf injuries that are usually four weeks. This is... This is a real bad one. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed for, for your club. But Will Day, a nasty one at, yep. at the Hawks and now Jacob Wiedering. We'll see a few more throughout the preseason. It's a high-risk time where players are, are fit. They're running at full velocity and the grounds are really hard. You often see a lot of knee injuries at this time of year. So, fingers yep. crossed. But the... The, cl- the player your club can ill afford to lose, 04 double three ninety eight eleven sixteen. 11 16 A lot of people texting in. Carlton's a very exciting team to watch for good and bad reasons. Yeah. When it's good, it's over the top. It's pure Hollywood. And when it's bad, as we know, the world is ending and um, and they can get volatile, the Navy Blue supporter base. So who has you sitting down on the beanbag or on the couch getting the popcorn out? Now, Richmond, Noah Bolter. He's, uh, he's a big unit. Uh, just a few people who have been down that way have observed, and we saw this a couple of years ago, he started 2022 in this role. Now, this is playing forward. Now, it didn't stick in 2022. Might not stick this time, but I wonder, with a new coach coming in, whether Adam Uze has seen something he's willing to stick with. Uh, he's been training as a forward anyway for the large part of the preseason, if not all of it. So will they bed him down in the front half? Um, we know he's pinched hit from time to time in the forward line as well. And as we say, it looked like he was going to start there in 2022. But I wonder if this is the year. So... You know, um, Jack Rewalt moves on. Um, Tom Lynch has some doubts over his fitness. I know they got Samson Ryan there. Uh, they brought Jacob Kaczynski across from Hawthorne as well. But could they also stuff Noah Bolter in there for a potential matchup nightmare, nightmare for the opposition? Well, you could. Um, can play at both ends. I, I like him back. I, it will depend on Gibkus. Like, he's, is he a big worry or what, Gibkus? Like, we all really like the pick. Mm. And what we saw early days, but he just hasn't been able to get right and, and really serious issues already for a young man with a hamstring isn't great. Is Bolter just going to play there until Tom Lynch gets back? I mean, Tom Lynch has, I think, just started running very slow laps on grass and uh, had surgery in July and, and that is not progressing anywhere near as fast as what it should. So is it a stopgap until he comes back? Or are they not confident in Kaczynski and Ryan? I don't know. I, mm. There's questions everywhere for Richmond. No, I, there's so many holes in, in the list, and and I get it. And, and Richmond fans hate it when I talk about it. This is the price you pay for success and the price you pay when you um, give up a lot at the draft table and you can't replenish your, your, your talent with younger players through the draft, which is the best way to do it. But Bolter's... You know, I think he's important for them behind the ball. That's where I'd have him. Mm. Um, but maybe they're just doing this until Tom Lynch is is sound, and, and hopefully he can get sound at some point in the second third of the year. And ditto for Josh Gibkiss, because the talent is there, and a lot of people are excited about uh, his future and his potential. So hopefully he can get his body right. He did go to Qatar. That's that's the new Munich, by the way, Qatar. You go to Qatar if you what want to get your body sign, right. What a great sign, is it, when you're a second-year player with a hamstring injury that's mm. forcing you to Qatar to try and get it fixed? They couldn't fix it in Australia? Obviously not. No, I guess. Mm. Well, I guess when you've got an issue like this, you want to get world's best practice. And if you can do it, and you've got the means, then you just go, don't you? And you try to get mm. to the bottom of it straight away. I suppose. Some pretty but, smart um, people in Australia, though. Oh, there are. Of course, there mm. are. And I'm no expert on this front, uh, Kane. And um, yeah, maybe maybe he could have. Maybe they did. Maybe they exhausted all other options. But uh, anyway, they've gone over to the Aspatar Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Hospital over there in in, in the Middle East. That was last October. So hopefully. That does the trick for Josh Gibkiss, just at 20 years of age. And that one was arguably even better, I reckon. I just spent the news break uh, watching Tony Modra highlights on YouTube, and they're still as good as you think they were. Yeah. Be- better. He floated. That's, on that's the yeah. other question I'm always interested in. So with milestone games, and Mark Williams was big on this, he used to compile like a, I don't know, three-minute highlight tape of the player whose milestone it was, and you get some people who were important to you speaking and, and congratulating you on it. If you could just condense a career into three minutes, who would have the best highlight? Reel in three? And, the, and this is a, such a difficult question because you can have some players who didn't have massive careers, but didn't they have some great highlight for a three minute highlight reel? If you were showing an alien from outer space, who would have the best? And, that, and, right. and you ask who would be the best footballer ever in three minutes? 
who would be your nomination? Qu- well, questions without notice, and you've given me some notice. So when we come to that segment, let's give our top three highlight reels. Top three, three-minute three three minute highlight, highlight reel. reel. That's it. Yeah. I- I'm going to declare this too hard, Kane. I, I can't. I can't shortlist three players, the best three-minute highlight reels. There's too many. I've got 10. I can't even get it down from 10. Yeah, it's it's a hard one. I find it really difficult as well, and it's something that's kept me up at night way too many times over the years. Do you want to give us? Have you got well, one? Well, just like, I think, like, Wayne Carey would be in it for me, like, if you're just going to condense a career. But then there's others, like, that haven't had the big careers. Like no, a, but that's the thing. That's uh, what makes so, it so hard. So, Jeff Farmer, if you just had a three-minute mm-hmm. snapshot of his career would be as mm-hmm. good as anyone's. I played with a guy called Daniel Motlop. Give me three minutes of Motlop highlights, yeah. and he will, honestly, he'll blow your mind with the stuff that he did I, on a football field. That, is the number one obvious? Like I feel like it is. Buddy? Gary Ablett Sr. Okay, I, see, I had Buddy in the mix as well. Yeah, one. I've got him third. I've got him third. I've got a controversial two, but I, I just thought two, for me, just – did things that, and it's a cliche, but no other player can do, but he literally did because he he picked the ball up with one hand like it was an apple <laughs> and he swung it over players as he they tried Cooter to tackle it. Too. Oh, well, I just thought his highlight reel, the size of the man, he could play every position yeah, on the ground yeah. before anyone else, literally everywhere. Mm. He would play midfield and there was a game where they sent Wayne Carey to run with him in the midfield because Dennis was so worried, Dennis Bogan, about what he could do. But then he slips forward at this game in Princess Park and he finishes with five goals and 40 possessions and 22 marks when marks were actually mm. a thing, where most of them were content. Like he, It was an extraordinary physical set of gifts it's, that he was given. It's just, I mean, three is really difficult because someone had Ablett Jr. highlights on the other day and what he yep. was doing. But then you can have like early Judd. Would Judd, his first five or six mind. years yeah. where he exploded out of a pack. <laughs> Peter Matera's three minute highlights, outrageous. Dacos, I reckon. I mean, they're every, like even someone like Akamanis, like what that guy oh, did. Yeah. If you Left can, for goals from 60 on the run three. against the boundary. Yeah, but then it depends what you want. You could easily go Jonathan Brown if you want courage. Like, no one did things on a football field that yeah. Jonathan Brown did. So I, I don't know. That's why it's an individual choice. Send them through. 